Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So we have turned seeking refuge from appalling circumstances into some form of offence and we appear to have turned Spain into our mortal enemy just in the space of a weekend. An absolutely astonishing turn of affairs. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The current political landscape, astonishingly good for my career, not so good for the soul. Um, Michael Howard is a former leader of the Conservative Party. He's not some Tim Pop buffoon from a far-right pressure group. He is, he is a respectable and thus far respected politician. And he not only... Uh, raised the spectre of the Falkland Islands, a military engagement undertaken against an invading force to protect British citizens from, um, uh, well, foreign invasion. In the context of EU negotiations, he then doubled down on it on, on Channel 4 News by, by saying that, that, that it was not a bad time to remind the Spanish of what we were like. Let me ask you about Gibraltar. You've campaigned in Gibraltar when a sovereignty <clears throat> issue came up under the Blair government. The EU says that Spain will have a veto on whether any <clears throat> Brexit deal, the free trade deal you're talking about, should apply to the ROC. How should the British government respond to that? as it has responded by making it absolutely clear that we will stand by Gibraltar. 35 years ago this week, Andrew, another woman Prime Minister sent a task force halfway across the world to protect another small group of British people against another Spanish-speaking country. And I'm absolutely clear that our current woman Prime Minister will show the same resolve in relation to Gibraltar as her predecessor did. Um, th 35 years ago this week, another woman Prime Minister sent a task force halfway across the world to defend the freedom of another small group of British people uh, against another Spanish-speaking country. And I'm absolutely certain that our current Prime Minister will show the same resolve in standing by the people of Gibraltar. Uh, but I do think it's a remarkable coincidence that it was 35 years ago this week that another woman Prime Minister sent a task force halfway across the world to protect another small group of British people against another Spanish-speaking country. I think it was ill-advised of the European Union to insert that reference to Gibraltar in their draft guidelines. Uh, and since they've done it, I can see no harm in reminding them what sort of people we are. But the logical end of what you're saying is we should go to war with Spain if necessary. No, what I'm saying is that the Prime Minister, our current Prime Minister, um, should, and I'm sure will, show the same resolve uh, in looking after the interests of Gibraltar as Margaret Thatcher did looking after the interests of the Falkland Islanders. Even if you're not advocating war as such, your comments are rather inflammatory and could actually uh, hinder EU negotiations in future. No, I don't think so. I, I'm simply drawing attention to a remarkable coincidence and uh, uh, a remarkable anniversary that we uh, should remember this week. Um, it's, the, it's the European Union that have started all this by uh, making this reference to Gibraltar in their draft guidelines. I mean, these are the moments, and then, I, then you, you kind of look at the passport argument, and one of the, um, there's a journalist called Tim Montgomery, who I quite like, I find him quite thoughtful and thought-provoking, which is the best you can hope for from a journalist, but he's just tweeted about Remainers who are giggling at the passport story, still not understanding the identity issues that, I don't want to misquote him, but, but the, the identity issues that lay behind the Brexit vote. He's absolutely right. I cannot conceive of any circumstances on earth in which the colour of my passport would in any way colour my pride in my country or my sense of self-worth. The Conservative Party, is he the chairman of the Conservative Party, Andrew Rosendahl? I, I read something from him at the weekend talking about how he felt humiliated every time he had to pull out his pink one. He was talking about passports. 
Uh, and you just sort of think, have I been standing in the queue at customs, utterly missing the existential angst that all my fellow tourists are feeling every time they clock the burgundy hue of their passport? I don't know. I, I mean, this is it, isn't it? This is yet more evidence of the massive divide that's running down the country where on one side people have a kind of mixture of spluttering incomprehension and on the other people have a kind of John Bull flavoured pride in things that don't appear to make any sense at all. And when you point out that they don't make any sense at all, you get told that that proves you don't understand it. You're damn right I don't understand it. Spain, how many people go on holiday to Spain every year? And how quickly... Can you turn them into enemies? It's incredible. How many people live in Spain? How many of us have got homes in Spain? Spain, guys. Spain. Not North Korea. <laughs> That's the war Donald Trump's probably going to be starting soon in order to distract attention away from the mess that is unfolding domestically and, of course, from the fact that the Russians effectively gifted him the U.S. election in a, in a tinsel-wrapped parcel. Got to distract attention from that. Got to do anything possible. What, what, throughout history, what do people do? Why, why did Putin go into Crimea to distract attention away from corruption at home? It's what these kind of leaders do. But we've got Spain in our sights. Spain, we used to sing songs about sunny Spain being a wonderful place to go. A viva España, Brexit happens, flick a switch, suddenly we're talking about going to war against them. Now, look, I said at the top of the show, I don't want any arguments today, and I don't, and it went well in the last hour, very illuminating last hour. I don't want any arguments this hour, or at least I'm not going to argue with you until I understand what your position is. When I understand what your position is, Maybe we'll have a sort of polite exchange of views. But the idea that... I mean, William Hague wrote about this. I remember mentioning the article to you. He, he name-checked Ulster. <laughs> How's that working out? And Gibraltar as being among the first casualties of a Brexit vote. He wrote a whole page about it in the Daily Telegraph. That was Project Fear. And then when it comes true, when Gibraltar does appear to have been in some way compromised constitutionally by the Brexit vote, what happens? They start talking about war. Instead of saying, I'm really sorry, I didn't understand the issue when I poo-pooed the idea that Gibraltar might become a pawn in Brexit negotiations. I'm really sorry for calling that project fear. I'm really sorry for calling you a liar. I'm really sorry that I didn't take it seriously. I just didn't really understand the issue. And God, it turns out you were right and I was wrong. No, 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 no. You don't say that, if you're Michael Howard. You say, well, we'll go to war against Spain then. And, and you think things aren't getting madder by the day? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Just talk to me about Gibraltar. Tell me anything you want. That's that that that's the question. Spain will contest. Spain does contest historically. Britain's three hundred year rule of Gibraltar. Geographically, it would be a bit like having the what can you actually see from the mainland? The Isle of Wight. It'd be a bit like the Isle of Wight being a Spanish outpost. But as long as it's populated by Spanish people, you kind of see that that becomes defensible. Gibraltar is populated almost entirely by people who see themselves as British. Now, I might need a history lesson from you on this. I think... I think that Britain prevented Spain acceding to the European Union until they opened up the border with Gibraltar, which meant that Gibraltarians will... would be able to travel to and from the mainland to shop, to work, to live. I think... If that's true, and I'm 80% certain, but you know how this program works. If, if I've made a mistake, then either Chris, who's producing me, or you, who are crowd producing me, will point out my error immediately. I'm pretty sure that that is still a bone of contention for, for, for the Spanish. The idea that we weren't allowed into the European Union until we were forced by Britain to surrender the tiny little grip we still had upon Gibraltar. I imagine that it becomes a basket case, economically speaking, almost overnight if the Spanish reimpose that border. But who is categorically not allowed to lecture other countries on border control? People who voted to leave the European Union in order to get more border control. So we find ourselves in such an absurd circle of idiocy that the only way out of it, if you campaigned, 
in that way is surely to throw a dead cat on the table. And as Donald Trump is proving with North Korea, there is no more effective dead cat in the world of distraction tactics than the prospect of military action. For two reasons. Number one, if you're not fully confident of your own intelligence, you begin to fear that perhaps if someone's mentioned war and you're not on their side, you might be unpatriotic. And number two, it's such a big card to play that it cannot go ignored, which is why people like Jack Straw end up on the radio this morning, presumably with, an ass with, with, with a sense of absolute incredulity to actually provide a rational response to the suggestion that r raising the prospect of war with Spain is an acceptable political move. So Jack Straw has to go on the, on the radio and say, well, it's absurd. It's a bit like hiring Jack Straw to come in and tell you that the sun's come up. Of course it's absurd. But the Daily Telegraph has run an article comparing the capabilities of our relative navies. Why? Well, because Gibraltarians voted to the tune of about 98% to remain in the European Union. Why? Because they get it. They understand things. And all the people that didn't? What do you do now? Either it's hands up, sorry, wrong, or it's, right, well, in that case, we'll drop nuclear bombs on Spain. That there's, I don't think, and this is where you'll come in and hopefully help me out a little bit, I don't know that there's anything in between the two. You either have to put your hands up and say, look, either I took a decision when I voted to leave the European Union that the residents of Gibraltar could just faff off. I just took a decision that they don't matter. Sod them. I, I, all right, their lives are going to be thrown into turmoil. Uncertainty, hopefully with a happy ending, but uncertainty for a period of time. Sod them. Don't care. Either you have to put your hands up and say that, and say, look, I don't care about the people of Gibraltar. I'm going to get a blue passport. You can kind of weigh the two up together. Or... You admit that you just didn't understand the issue, you didn't get it, you didn't know the history, you don't know the politics, you don't understand the, uh, uh, the, the difference between Britain inside the European Union and Britain outside it. Because what the European Union will do, this is the, this is the next stage of the debate, isn't it? When everything that goes wrong will get blamed on them and their negotiators in a, in a kind of... Well, again, I can no longer express incredulity at the idiocy of some of the positions being explored by politicians in this country. Because... What, what will happen next? They will defend the interests of their members. This is what the European Union will do. They did it for us when we were members. I, I, I know we still are, ostensibly, but in the context of the negotiations, we're not. So they will do whatever is best for their members. Okay? So the big, big, big gap in all of this, historically speaking, is where the hell were people explaining to us what the EU had ever done for us? Where were they? Even during the Remain campaign, where were they? Answer, keeps Gibraltar British. And remember when David Cameron suggested that peace might be compromised by voting to leave the European Union, and everybody embellished it to describe it as a prediction of World War Three. We are less than a week away from the triggering of Article 50, and one of David Cameron's predecessors, as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party in this country, has posited the notion of going to war with Spain. But remember, when David Cameron said the European Union had played a role in peace throughout continental Europe throughout the 20th century, that was the biggest evidence yet of Project Fear. That was the biggest evidence yet of exaggeration and embellishment. Within a week of triggering Article 50, Michael Howard is talking about it being a good idea to remind the Spanish of what we're like by citing the Falklands War. What are you going to do, laugh or cry? Or cheer, I suppose. Some people will be cheering. Yay! Bomb the Spanish! Woohoo! It, it just doesn't even begin to make sense on any rational level, which is why then you get the people piling in talking about identity and somehow giving themselves a free pass on rational levels. Because there's nothing rational about feeling more British if your passport is pink than you do when your passport is yellow. That's not rational. That's daft. There is nothing rational about suggesting that a negotiation that involves a big lump of rock, a couple, what is it, a couple of hundred meters away from the Spanish shore, is not going to be on the table during negotiations and that the European Union is not duty bound to back its member state in any looming battle with a non member state. It's what union means. It's what the actual word means union. So when there were 28 members of that union, they couldn't pick a side. Nor should they pick a side. They'll go with the status quo. Now there are 27 members of that union and us. What side do you think they're going to pick? Give us a buzz.
Help me out. Make me feel a little better about Gibraltar. I, I said in the first hour that there would almost definitely be somebody listening in, in Croydon, and I was right. But I want you, I'm going to, I think I'm, I'm not even, I'm cocky enough to suggest that there'll definitely be someone currently listening to this program in Gibraltar. But you will have a link with it. You may have a history there. You may have a heritage there. You may well have me on in Gibraltar. I hope you do. But I, I, I kind of want some light rather than heat on this. I, I, how, I, how worried should Gibraltarians be? 0345 6060 973. That, that's kind of the grown up question, if you will. I think the slightly more excitable question has to be. Is anybody? Presumably, people are. But but how can how can you be anything other than utterly bamboozled by the sheer idiocy of raising the prospect of war with Spain in the first week of a two-year-long negotiation? It may be. I can't quite imagine it myself. It may be that threatening war at some point in this two-year negotiation will become a good tactic. It may be that threatening to go to war against the French or the Germans or the Spanish or the Portuguese, that become a yeah, great play, well done, excellent, yeah, that'll teach them. In the first week of a two-year negotiation, to actually mention war, and I stress again, my reason for talking about this is the identity of the man who did it. If it was a newspaper columnist or a broadcaster, someone chasing clicks and giggles, then that's fine. We know how that world works. You say things you don't mean in order to get a massive emotional reaction and then pat yourself on the back for spreading the kind of hatred that will leave ah, MPs dead on the doorstep of their constituency offices. Great, well done, well played. But this is the leader of the Conservative Party, as was. And it's also, of course, the most ridiculous proof possible that David Cameron had at least a point when he suggested that leaving the European Union would have some sort of impact upon European security. How do you prove that, James? Well, Michael Howard just suggested going to war with the Spanish. What? No, no, he, he, he really did. I mean, give me a call about Gibraltar and sort of splutter down the phone at me. It's just a genuinely, a genuinely... <sighs> What's the word I'm looking for? So, so anyone who can just explain to me what the hell Michael Howard is playing at without descending into spluttering incomprehension. It's, it's quite incredible. And that, that, that William Hague article in The Telegraph, I'll tweet that as well, turning into a, um, a news source here. It's, it's from May of last year, so about a thousand years ago. If your native land is Gibraltar, the Falkland Islands, or Northern Ireland, your right to remain British requires a vigilance, a resolve, and sometimes the exertion of an effort that has come recently to Scotland and is still unfamiliar to most of us in England and Wales. Uh, and uh, the, the article goes on to warn against the dangers. If the, EQ, if the UK leaves the EU, Gibraltar leaves with it, and the economic impact on its people, particularly the damage done to its financial services industry, would be very serious. For Spain, the legal constraints on a more hostile approach would be lifted, potentially leading to severe disruption of trade and workers at the border, or even a return to the past policy of a total land blockade. Small wonder that the Chief Minister of Gibraltar has said that a British exit could have disastrous consequences for the people on the rock. May, last year, Daily Telegraph. Fingers and ears, eyes shut, blah, 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 project fair, project fair, project fair, yeah, now it's happening. 22 after 11. Richard's in New Elton. Richard, what would you like to say? Hello, yeah, I'd just like to say that, um, first of all, I should explain, I'm half Spanish, half English, and so I, I understand both sides of the argument. Sure. Uh, but, but first of all, I'd like to say that um, uh, Gibraltar is actually attached to Spain. So You can drive there. Can, you don't have to swim. You, you, can, you can actually walk there. Yes. I've done it a number of times. And Does it depend on the tides? Is it like Mont Saint-Michel? No, 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 it doesn't matter on the, yeah, I know you're joking, but it doesn't matter uh, on the tide, you can actually walk through there. So it's a land border, uh, like Northern Ireland? Yes, and I've, I've walked past there without anyone checking passport or, or anything like that, yes, so it, that's an important point to appreciate. So yes. From a Spanish perspective, it's very humiliating that Gibraltar is under British rule, because it would be a bit like a bit of Cornwall being owned by the French. For instance, I don't think the British would take that very kindly if, if that were to happen. So you have to understand the Spanish perspective in that. Yes, I, I, do, I mean, I do. It, it's, I use but, the Isle of Wight as an example of and imagining what if that had been populated, yes. still belonged to Spain. Uh, you, you, you understand equally 
your half English bit, the, the fact yeah. that the, the, the massive, massive majority of people on Gibraltar consider themselves British. Uh, and, well, most and, definitely. Yes. I've, I've got friends who, who are, who are um, um, well, an Irish friend that works in, in Gibraltar, and I can fully understand their position, you know. Uh, from, from my, my British side believes that Brit, uh, Gibraltar should remain... Uh, uh, yes. And, and the British rule, and and and, and that's because the the British the Gibraltar people want to be British, and also Spain gave away Gibraltar in a treaty about three hundred years ago. Yes, but I, I think that it's a pity that both sides cannot work with each other to to kind of appease the Spanish position without uh, people in Gibraltar being worse off and. And not be nervous because I, I I do understand the Gibraltars. Uh, yes. they, they they do want to remain British, and if I was in Gibraltar, I would want to remain British. But it's a pity that things cannot be arranged so that the Spanish flag could also be there without Gosh. having without having any 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 real power, any deeper meaning. And and uh, argu exactly. arguably that would have been easier to achieve when we were in the European Union. Well, I don't think it really matters. Uh, but in terms of in terms of cooperation and, you, and, and mutual well, interest, you can have a flag there, a Spanish flag. It doesn't need to be mean anything. But I suppose from a Spanish perspective, they would feel. They would <laughs> Do you feel know, I'm about to, say, I'm about to yeah. say to you, come off it, mate. The average Spaniard isn't going to have the cockles of his heart warmed by the mere presence of a flag on the rock. And then I've remembered I'm living in a country where the colour of a passport. I, 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 can tell you, I can tell you from a Spanish perspective, uh, I think that would. That would appease many of them to say, oh, look, you know... It's, yes, I, I, of course I have to believe you, because I live in a country where people apparently consider the colour of their passport to be more important than the ease through which you can use it to get into other countries. But, but that's important. When you're, when you're proud of your country, yes. that's, that, that's, that, that's something that... That's an approach that you take. If, if, if of you're... Course. If you're not proud of your country, then you don't care the, on, on the colour of your passport. Oh, so you come off it. You'd be proud it's, of your country. You don't care about the colour of your passport. Were you not proud of Britain when your passport was burgundy and you suddenly become proud if it goes back to being blue? Well, I, I, I used to prefer the old, the old colour. And I, I, and I am proud to be British as well as proud to be Spanish. And I, 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 oh, it, can it you is, be both in the modern world? Can, can you be both in binary, binary Britain? Are you allowed to be proud of being British and Spanish? Because your Spanishness involves your, yes. your, your but, European Unionness as well, and that makes you a traitor. Yes, but, but this, is, this is the irony. I, 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 um, I wanted a united Europe, um, and I'm half Spanish, but I voted for Brexit. <laughs> uh, that, that, so it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite ironic, really. And, well, and ironic's because, one word. Because, what, happens, what, what happens to Gibraltar if they, um, if they do bring back the full blockade? I, I mean, I, presumably that's unlikely, because it would damage Spanish economic interests as well. But what, what happens if, if they bring it back to kind of Franco-style foreign policy? No, I, th I think all this is just political uh, posturing. Um, the British are doing what the British do, and the Spanish will do what the Spanish do. Yes. And I think in the but end... They might, not be, be they might not be mutually acceptable. Uh, Michael Howard is already talking about war. Yes, but that's just... <laughs> That's just the press just twisting his words. He didn't specifically mention... No, no he did. The, the, he did. On Channel 4 News last night, he said, I think that using the Falklands to remind the Spanish what we're like is a good idea. Well, you know... Well, oh, come on! Mention, he, didn't just... mention, but he, he didn't say... He, did he actually mention the, 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 the word war? That we're going to go to war with Spain over Gibraltar? Because I don't think anyone who's got any common sense seriously believes that. There's well, no way I, I don't. I don't think anyone thing. who's got any common sense seriously believes that, Richard. But I'm afraid you've just reminded us that there's a massive shortage of common sense abroad at the moment, and uh, and that that may be proof of it. Just just to clarify, because I do want to have this conversation as well. Just just, and I've only got a minute left, but I don't want you to feel that I close you down. T tell me how the colour of your passport affects the quality of pride that you have in being British. Well, it, it, it's it's just I I think that what this country lacks is people being more proud of their nation. I'm, I'm Spanish, so I understand. Spanish people are, are very proud no, I'm gonna, of their nation. I've, I've, I'm going to push you. I've only got a minute. In terms of yeah, how, right. how the quality well, of that pride know. changes if the colour changes, because I can tell you now, my pride in my country won't be changed an iota by that, even if my passport was lime green with pink dots on it. 
I, I think the problem is there's so much political correctness in this country, and, and you don't have that. <laughs> we playing so bingo. People, people, people want to people want to express their frustrations with a colour for the passport. In right. Spain, so, so no you will feel less that. proud of your Spanish heritage because you have to keep a European Union passport than you will no, of your Brit. No, I didn't say that. Oh. I'm already proud. I'm I'm already proud to be Spanish. I, and when I'm in Spain, I'm not frightened about being politically correct. I can, if, if something's black, I can call it black. In England, so, that's not the case. Well, what can't you, know, you call I mean, black in England, it's, Richard? It's, it's, well, in, in England, we're so politically correct. Now, go on. Just There's tell me what you can't wrong. say. Tell me what you can't say. There's so many things. Well, what just give me one. Well, well I, if you've been listening to the LBC recently, you, 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 you'll see... Mate, we've got yeah, presenters yeah. on LBC who've been publicly endorsed by former leaders of the Ku Klux Klan, and you're telling well, me that you can't publicly say things that you want to say. Well, it just gets ridiculous. Give me an example. Well, you know, it, 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 there was a programme the other day talking about, or yesterday, talking about, you, you can't say chairman. You have to say chairperson. No, but, uh, you, Richard, you can. You just said chairman. The people who do these stories are doing it entirely to, to, to infuriate you. Chairman, yes, chairman, well, chairman, well, chairman, 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 insane, chairman, insane, chairman. Insane, mankind, insane, mankind, insane, mankind, insane, mankind, insane, mankind. Why do you believe insane. this? So, sorry to interrupt, but in Spain, <laughs> they don't even talk about these kind of things because this is just silliness. And what well, I'm In Britain, they don't England. talk about these kind of things until the newspapers print them and rabble-rousers get hold of them and a bunch of silly students in the middle of nowhere who've tried to ban the Daily Mail or change the vocabulary of teaching get given about a million times more attention than they deserve, Richard. But just, just before you go, because I'm late for the news, what is it you can't say in this country that you wish you could? Well, there's, there's, there's many things. If you, if you start talking about oh, race, for instance, you'll get called a racist. Go on, then. What, what, what can't you in, say about in, race? In, in, in Spain, you, couldn't, you, you wouldn't be called a racist when here in this country you would be called a racist. For what? For what sort of comment? Simple, when you say simple, simple things like, oh, there's too many immigrants in this country. That's not racist. People, 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 exactly. But in England, I've been called a racist. And this is the irony. I've been called a racist because I said, yes, there's too many immigrants. But you're one of them. England is no... England in some parts of London, I've lived in East London, in some parts of London, England is no longer England. And when I've said that, I've been called a racist. What? And I say, well, that's funny enough. I'm not 100% British. I'm 50% you... British. No, I know. But, but, I mean, you're part of the problem then. Because you're only half English. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm... No, but you just said I'm, parts of East London aren't English anymore. You're only half English. I'm, I'm British. No, you're I'm half, British you're half, mate. Well... So you if, if we're you're diluting, if we're diluting our Englishness in any way, if we're diluting our Englishness in any... I'm sorry to interrupt, Richard. If we're diluting our Englishness in any way, then being yeah. half English is surely the most perfect proof positive of your point. Well, you could argue that. I'm not arguing that. Argument is that it's it's I true. Respect, I respect I respect British values. I want to live. When I'm in living in England, I respect I, I live the way the British live. Yes. I work the way the British live. Except work. that you except and, that you're half you're half Spanish, mate. You're probably I don't know, anchovies or something, don't you? <laughs> I mean that's not the British way. Patatas bravas. We call them chips, my friend. How dare you dilute our culture in this way? You're quite right. There are parts of this country that aren't even English anymore. Some of them are half Spanish. It's 11.30. A number of spectators aimed gestures and shouted racist abuse at the 23-year-old at the Circuit de Catalunya on Saturday. One group of young men wore wigs, dark makeup, and T-shirts with the words Hamilton's family written on them. I was just sort of looking for evidence of the last caller's uh, claim that in Spain there's no such thing as political correctness. And he's absolutely right. You're allowed to be publicly racist towards someone like Lewis Hamilton in a crowd and not be considered beneath contempt by other people. Great. David is in Whitehaven to talk to us about Gibraltar. David, what would you like to say? Uh, yeah, well, I think the Gibraltar issue, um, one, was an entirely predictable. Um, I think your programme news night did a very good feature on um, what the problems are going to be in Gibraltar. I can't, I can't claim any credit for that, mate. I'm doing about one a month at the moment, so um, there's, no, there's no, 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 no kudos for me in being involved in what you saw. To remind me what they did about Gibraltar. They, they, they pointed out that this was on the horizon, did they? They, 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 they really sort of said that you're one of the losers if um, if, if the referendum vote was... But that, that was Project Fear, remember? Yes, yes. But, uh, uh, well, it, it certainly didn't uh, did, didn't sort of upset the Gibraltarians who voted 96% to remain. You know, they, they, they knew which side of the, the, of the toast the jam was on, didn't they? <laughs> 
<laughs> That's usually butter, isn't it? That's usually butter and bread, but I like your your 21st it's century. It's part of the country. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it jam and toast in Whitehaven? Yeah, look, look, at, look at John Bishop and Jam eaters. Oh, good. What, what about, and, and I, I mean, I presume that nobody's going to be sort of publicly saying that this is good or fine. Last fella came a bit close, but I don't think he'd fully understood Michael Howard's actual comments. Michael Howard raising the prospect of war in the context of Gibraltar in the first week of Brexit negotiations. I, I, talk to me in a way that doesn't make that sound bonkers. Um, very difficult because uh, uh, one of his um, arch, arch buddies, Andrew Russendale, was talking in very similar um, tones <coughs> on Saturday on Matt Fry's programme, you know, um, re re really doing a, a character assassination on the Spanish and how they were an awful country and um, they, weren't, they weren't going to be allowed to get away with it. Uh, I, I, I suspect it's, it's, it's the real sort of flavour of, uh, of Brexit coming through and, um, and I say it's starting to unravel to a certain extent and the, uh, and, uh, and, and the, the, the Eurosceptics of the xenophobes in the Tory party are, um, are, 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 are having to sort of... How do, I mean, it's, it, it's, as if, it's as if we're kind of falling into this utter, utter inability to imagine how it looks from the other side of the, for, from the, other side of the table, isn't it? It's, I mean, imagine yeah. if, if there's such a thing as Spanish patriotism and the suggestion that we're going to go to war. How's that going to play out? Not just in Spain, but across the whole of Europe. I mean, David Cameron was derided when he suggested that leaving the European Union might impact upon the safety and security of Europe. The phrase World War Three, I don't think he ever actually uttered, but by the time it had been through the lens of media coverage, it, it, that, that's the headline that everybody remembers. World War Three, if we leave. Within a week, within, what is it, three or four days of triggering Article 50, a former leader of the Conservative Party is talking about war with Spain. Absolutely appalling, and uh, as I said, just shows that the 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 losing the, the sort of rational argument on uh, on on leaving the EU. You know, it's um, it, it's it, it's the refuge of um, charlatans and, um, and and and. and the, People who know the, you know, they've, they've got uh, answers to provide, but can't can't do it. I suspect you. I suspect that it is a sort of. Deg I don't know in Michael Howard's case whether it would be actually. I, I, I guess. I guess if you're asked a question about something and you are responsible for the plight of the people on Gibraltar and you were warned that this would happen, you have two choices. You either say, sorry, I got that really wrong. Thank God I'm not Gibraltarian. <laughs> uh, bad luck, you lot. Or you, you do what he did and just sort of find an enormous dead cat to throw into the middle of the interview. Yes, I think we might go to war with Spain. Next question, please. Uh, Steve is in Gatwick. Steve, what would you like to say? Hi James, uh, yeah, just thought I'd, uh, I'd give a call in. I've been living in Spain. My family's been there sixteen years, and uh, uh, how much? How much of the Spanish cultural identity do you feel personally responsible for diluting, Steve? Uh, not, not, not really that much. <laughs> we live in a, well, a, a, outside of the Spanish village. We're nowhere near the coast. Carry on. I was, yeah, I was yanking your chain. I guess if you go to parts of the Costa, then it will be like being in sort of Blackpool, yeah. but with better weather. But the idea that that somehow dilutes Spain is, is as absurd as suggesting that my half British, half Spanish caller a moment ago somehow dilutes Englishness. But what, what, how does this, how do these words reach your ears then as someone who moves between the two countries with, with relative ease? Well, what it is, obviously, I vote to stay in because obviously, um, my family's in Spain, my twins were born in Spain, and my son was born here. Um, so, you know, that, that's going to affect us. But I'm like you, James, I'm from an Irish background, so yeah. I, can get an, I can just get an Irish passport. But the, the, the backlash now from what Michael Howard said is going to really backlash on the English. And, and, and I'll give them a call late today because uh, they're, they're, they're very patriotic. They'll, they'll jump on a bandwagon for any, any little thing said against Spain. We get, we get, I know you never hear it in the news or see it in the papers, but we get a quite a hard life down there. The expats, you speak to the Germans, the Dutch, the Swedes, the Belgians. It's the same thing. But this is going to really, really cause a lot of trouble. Down a there. hard life how? You mean you, you're not that welcome? No, exactly, exactly. Because it, it, there's no political correctness, which your last caller said in Spain. Oh, I know. <laughs> Just ask Lewis uh, Hamilton. My kids, in, my, kids, my kids are in Spanish school. They've had arguments with the teachers over Gibraltar because the Spanish teachers say it's, it's Spanish. 
and and and, and it's, it's crazy, crazy stories. I could be on all day talking about it. But so the, the, what he said now is going to backlash on us is, is badly. It's it'll be reported in the Spanish equivalent of the Sun, whatever that is, as as effectively pointing the sights of a gun upon Spain. Absolutely, El País, which is the main the main uh, main right. TV paper, they'll they'll have that in there. And and you know, I've been I've been in arguments in pubs. Uh, uh, even with my Spanish friends over at Gibraltar, it's very, very heated. It's like, I suppose, like the, the North and South of Northern Ireland, you know, Protestants, Catholics. Yeah, and there's a, there's, a, there's a three centuries old grievance there that the European Union never healed, but at least managed to kind of hold hold together. I increasingly see these things as like uh, uh, lids. You can put a lid on things and, and hope that mm. things are going to calm down. There's a possibility, of course, that the lid will blow off at some point subsequently. But the the whole deal, and this it's almost impossible to think of this from a British point of view because of all the poison that's been poured into our ears about the European Union. But for Spain, the, the, the reluctant surrendering of that claim to Gibraltar, the reluctant opening of that land border was a price that they mm. pragmatically paid in order to accrue the benefits of being in the European Union. So it doesn't take away the regret and the resentment about having had to do it, but now that we're not in the European Union anymore, those chickens are coming home to roost. They, they, James, they will make it physically impossible. They will, they will cause so much traffic. They keep talking about the, the smuggling, cigarette smuggling over, and that's the excuse for doing the traffic stops yeah. and the searches. But actually, double the amount of, of, of cigarettes and smuggling comes over the Andorra border, but they never talk about that. It's so they're going to make life. They're going to make life tough for so for, for tough, Brits on Gibraltar. And, and cause, but the trouble is, we, we, like I say, you know, we can get into so much the in-depth problems that the Brits. Well, they're not just the Brits, the Germans, Dutch, French. Uh, I tend not to mix with the Spanish as much now after sixteen years shame. because some of the the arguments is crazy. And it's not a drink fueled or anything like that. It's just passion, you know, passion about. And, and Gibraltar is like. Uh, well, uh, do you know what the best way to explain it is, Steve? In my in my touchy feely way. The, the, the Spanish feel as passionately about Gibraltar as 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 as, as some Brits do. They do, yeah. You, you know, they, they do, absolutely <laughs> do. And, and there's two sides of every story. But you speak to a lot of English, there, a lot of English down here that just want to get on their lives. You know, ninety percent of them are retired. Um, but, but it fuels, it rolls on, and they say the, the Brits or the foreigners are here to take our jobs. You know, the average wage in Spain is six hundred euros a month. You know, what Europeans going to go down to work in Spain? Plus, you'll never, ever, ever, even fluent speaking Spanish, ever be employed by a Spanish company. Ever. Because you're not a national. So, then they come here, and it's all, we're trying to explain and say, look, everyone goes to England because it's so prosperous, it's so multicultural, but they're not bothered. It's Spain is for the Spanish, and they will only employ Spanish. So, it's all, and it all rolls off. It all rolls off from, the, from starting off in Gibraltar. Uh, but we, we get a hard life down there. Uh, hey, no, Steve, you're, 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 you're a lesson. You're an education for a lot of people listening, myself included, and I, and I, and I thank you for it. My, my sort of knowledge of, of, of Spanish culture is a, a little more rarefied than yours. I, one of my closest friends lives in, in Palma in, in Gran Canaria, and uh, it has a Spanish wife, and they're raising their children in, in, in the kind of international world. But um, it's not what you would call nativistic Spanish that, that I get exposed to when I visit. 11.45 is the time. Graham in Bradford says, I wonder if we can get Calais back. Surely we've got more nukes than France. I think that was the first bit of history I ever learned that Queen Elizabeth died. Was it? Oh no, it proves it, doesn't it? My parents should get a refund. It was Mary that lost Calais, wasn't it? She died with Calais on her heart. When I said that was the first bit of history I ever learned, I may have slightly misused the word learned. Just in from our political editor, Theo Usherwood, the Prime Minister spokesman has ruled out sending a task force to Gibraltar. I guess that counts as good news, does it, in Brexit Britain? We're not sending a task force to Gibraltar, a rock that has a land border with a country that contains more British citizens than any other country in the world except Britain. I think it does. Hashtag fact check. So there you go. Everyone, everyone relax. But he also repeatedly refused to condemn Lord Howard's comments, stating he was trying to establish the resolve that we have. Right, come here a minute. Imagine we were in Downing Street. Put the ashtray back. Imagine we were uh, having a chat about this. You, we, we're on Theresa May's team, you and me, right? If, if, if we can get the Gibraltar flag flying, if we can get this ship to, to sail, no more talk about Northern Ireland for a while, no more talk about trade tariffs, no more talk about the economy. No. The thing is, we've, we've, we've kind of presumed that the massive majority of the British public can be persuaded to punch themselves in the face by the combined efforts of the Daily Mail and the Sun. I've got a level with you, Theresa. I, I, I'm beginning to think there is no limit 
to the amount of idiocy they will back if we just couch it in the right phrases and keep Messrs. Dacre and Murdoch on side. Seriously, I think we might be able to raise the prospect of a war with Gibraltar, a war with Spain over Gibraltar as the most magnificent distraction from all of the problems that are going to affect the 65 million people living here as opposed to the 30,000 living on Gibraltar. And anyway, 96% of them voted to remain, so screw them. How plausible is that? As a distraction, it's magnificent. Why are we even talking about this? I don't know, James, it's your show. You decided to. Yeah, all right. That bit was my fault. But, but why is this even on the top of the news agenda? For me, it was the personnel involved. For me, it was the fact that a former leader, a man who stood to be prime minister, would talk about war in the context of Spain before the ink was even dry on the letter that Theresa May has just sent to, the, uh, to Donald Tusk. Before the ink was even dry on that letter, we're talking about war with Spain. And when David Cameron suggested that there would be security implications of leaving the European Union, everyone called him a... Uh, uh, you know, the language is almost slipping from my memory. It's so inept and inadequate. Project Fear, it was. Project Fear, to suggest that our security is linked to our European Union membership. Within three or four days of triggering the process of leaving our European Union membership, a former leader of the Conservative Party is talking about war with Spain. Can you just make sense of this in a way that doesn't sort of leave you caught between chuntering incomprehension and just wry amusement? All I've got is none of it means anything. They're just doing it so that we don't talk. Same reason Donald Trump's talking about North Korea, so we don't talk about stuff that's happening closer to home. Problem with that is, as a theory, Actually, I think there's quite a strong historical case to suggest that Spain will kick off about this. Uh, I call a Steve a moment ago, lives out there. So it's a massive issue to the Spanish. It's kind of like the catnip, if you will, to Spanish nationalism. So what will they do? Close the border just to prove a point? And what does the European Union do? It doesn't come down anymore on the, on the side with the most rational arguments or the most historical justification. It comes down on the side of its member. And that ain't us. Happy days. Harry's in Swindon. Harry, what would you like to say? Oh, I took that as a um, bit of a worrying bit of news from you this morning, James, about the uh, what Michael Howard has said about Gibraltar, just because when we joined the European Union, when it was set up originally, it was an idea of all the European nations coming together to try and keep peace and give us common goals to, um, to have in our futures going forward, and then to seemingly have such a flippant remark about going to war with another country that we're meant to be currently cooperating with. And, and hoping, and hoping look upon us favorably, favorably during negotiations, because I, I mean, we all need to swat up a little bit on the rubric, but I'm presuming that, that every member state has the power of veto over any deal that's put before the, the Union, the 27 remaining members, in the same way that we could have vetoed, although Brexit leaders, of course, uh, either lied about this or neglected to mention it, we could have vetoed at any point further integration, further federalisation, or the formation of a European Union army. So Spain presumably can veto whatever deal is put on the table in front of them. Two years hence. Well, I, I totally agree. I think it's a bit and of we're a... We're threatening to blow them up. I mean, with, so, with so many Brits in Spain and those that actually kind of probably would still want to move over there as well... It's a kind of worrying one to what should be probably one of our closest allies based on kind of citizen-wise. Um, I mean, there might be others on there based on um, what we can do with regards to trade, but surely that's got to be a good move to try and keep Spain on side to get their vote to, um, to make the security of our citizens that are living there at the moment. The, the thing is, though, I, I think what we're looking at is... Um I think what we're looking at now is that denial stage. So you can't, that nobody, especially the more prominent you were in the run up to the referendum, the more effort you put into urging voters to ignore the warnings of people like William Hague or David Cameron, and, and God, it's a mark of how mad things have become that I'm sitting here kind of defending those two. But it, it, either, either they have to say, we were wrong, we've made a big mistake, hopefully it's not a, a, a massive mistake, i.e. I, Brexit's not a mistake, but we were certainly wrong about Gibraltar. And if they can't do that, and it's in the news, it's out there, the, 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 you know, the, the, the genie is out of the bottle, the Gibraltarian genie is out of the bottle. They have two choices. They either appeal to that kind of brain-dead nativistic sentiment that is working so well for them at the moment and try and turn it into a kind of nationalistic ideology battle by mooting war, or they put their hands up and say they've, they've done a boo-boo. I think some of the problem, like with, with a lot that comes out in the press at the moment, whether it's the UK or whether it's um, America, where it's trying to use kind of a, a distraction technique to keep us looking, well, 
like a hand really magician almost but they don't want to be looking where where we should be would you rather go to war against north korea or spain harry i'm going to have a text vote <laughs> I don't think war's a very good idea with any of them. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Ramona, Ramona, Ramona. North Korea or Spain? Answer the question. Who do you want to go to war with first? Oh, I think based on what's on my doorstep, I'd probably say North Korea because it's no, not quite as near as what we are. Nuclear power, though. And we'll probably have a, we'll probably have a few more backers on there to support us as well if we chose that. You could be if right. North Korea than we with Spain. We could nuke Spain. Unfortunately, most of our nukes are in Scotland. And they want to try and cut themselves adrift, so we might lose those as well. <laughs> no, they can't take our nuclear bombs. <laughs> oh, God, you've got to laugh. Oh, we haven't even started talking about passports yet. If you think we've reached peak surrealism, you better think again. Uh, George is in Surrey. George, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, I'd just like to say um, I respect your opinion, but obviously I don't really agree with it. But my personal opinion of what he said, because he didn't actually directly say war with Spain. My personal opinion of what he said was... He was, it was almost like a statement of power, I personally believe, where he said, um, like, look at the Falklands. The, Fal the Falklands when, what? When, look at the Falklands War. The Falklands what? The Falklands War. What's that last word you said, the, the one that came after Falkland? <laughs> yeah, the Falklands War. And what was, uh, what was the word you told me it was significant he didn't mention at the beginning of your call? War, but I... Oh, I link, all right, carry on, I'll George. I'll link it on, but basically... What I mean is, Argentina invaded a sovereign British territory, and we retaliated. I think what he, what um, the ex leader is sort of saying is, if it happened, like we are not going to let ourselves be pushed around over something which 98% of people in Gibraltar want to remain part of the United Kingdom. No, the European Union, George. I, I, I appreciate that you don't agree with my opinion, but you'll recognise we have to agree on objective facts. The, the, I think it's 96% and they voted to remain in the European Union. I think it's probably closer to 100 if they took a vote on wanting to stay in the United Kingdom. Yeah, so that's understandable. But I, coming because I'm 16, so obviously you would have, you'd know probably a lot more than I would, but this is my first opinion. It's no probably about it, but you take care of yourself, yeah. mate. Just counting is always a good start when you're talking about statistics, it really is. And of course, Scotland also voted to remain within the United Kingdom recently, while simultaneously or shortly afterwards voting um, to remain within the European Union as well. It looks increasingly likely that both of those things are not going to be able to be simultaneously possible. But you take care, George, seriously. It's coming up to 12 noon. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Younger generation there just responding to that attempt to, to dead cat it, turn it into a... It's a show of our strength. It's not. It's a show of our absolute impotent idiocy.